Are investigators then also looking into other things, say the previous World Trade Center bombing or the embassy bombings, and trying to see if any other figures there might be linked to anything uh, that was planned for Tuesday or might be planned for the days to come? Well, they started that in day one. We reported that uh, on the first day. They were going back looking for clues because if you're starting with the premise that Osama bin Laden is the number one suspect, then you're going to have to look at the past cases and connect them to this one. And certainly the top lieutenants in all of those cases are the same people because it's a tight-knit group. He doesn't deal with a lot of people. He's got a couple of top lieutenants, and its information is held closely. So if they can tie all of these together, it will really uh, bolster all the cases. They can find out uh, who bombed the USS Cole, perhaps, and solve this at the same time. It's going to be very difficult, though. Do, do they, in understanding the, the web of Osama bin Laden, do they have any fix on the possibility of numbers, of how many people that are either tightly or loosely affiliated with his organization might be in the United States? How many people might be in the United States? Um, either tightly no. or loosely. No. I, you know, for, for a few years, I've been trying to get some figures on that and and we're talking about sleeper cells here and and these are people brought into the country by the al-qaeda organization told to go to the united states and they are here for years and and b precisely because they're sleeper cells they're like anybody else you can't tell them apart from any normal citizen it's very hard to get a count uh, we're working on that, though. I, I'm looking to get an answer on that, and I hope to have one here very shortly. And people who might have been in this country for years, in other words, we think uh, perhaps a terror operation would, say, come in and plan six weeks from now or three oh. weeks from now. These operations might have been planned or outlooked or organized uh, over months and years? Look, we reported yesterday that the, that the seeds for this may have been planted at an con uh, Islamic conference uh, in uh, Khartoum uh, in the Sudan uh, back in 1994 uh, when a, a lot of the world's uh, terrorists got together after the regular day business at this meeting. And we know that, that federal authorities, intelligence officials are looking at perhaps the seeds for everything we're seeing right now from Kobar Towers uh, that bombing, to the USS Cole, to this present horrific terrorist attack in the United States, the seeds may have been planted there. So you're looking six, seven years before uh, in, a, in a big concept, big picture. In terms of a, a USS Cole attack, could be two years, three years. These things are planned well in advance, and some of the people are put in years in advance. CNN's national correspondent Mike Betcher following up on all aspects of the investigation. Thanks very much, Mike. Wolf? Thank you, Joey. And as investigators work to put together the pieces of the puzzle surrounding Tuesday's violence, they're finding a number of links between the suspected hijackers. CNN's Brent Sadler has more on the background of one man believed to have died when a plane he upped hijacked crashed into a Pennsylvania field. A possible White House suicide pilot or the face of an innocent passenger, 26-year-old Ziad Jarrah from Lebanon. The United States Justice Department says he was one of the hijackers on United Flight 93, which crashed in a field some 80 miles from Pittsburgh shortly after three other jets struck the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Flight 93, whose passengers might have wrestled the hijackers, causing the plane to crash, could have been targeting the very heart of America and President Bush himself. In Lebanon's Bekaa Valley, though, Ziad Jarrah's family insists there's no hard evidence to prove any of that. He never uh, acted or talked in a way that uh, you, you, you could have uh, an understanding that he, he might be related to this. In Germany, investigators now say the Technical University in Hamburg, with its now closed prayer room, is where Jarrah and two other alleged hijackers studied. Mohammed Atta, whom U.S. authorities believe was aboard the first plane to hit the World Trade Center, and Marwan al-Shihi flying in the second aircraft to hit the Twin Towers. 
Ziad Jahra's family are Sunni Muslims, well-educated and well-to-do. They spoke of a young man whose personality, they claim, does not fit the profile of an Islamic fundamentalist bent on terror. He has his girlfriend, he goes to nightclubs, he drinks sometimes. His way of life can't be related to these parts. Zia Jahra's way of life away from home started in Germany. He began to study engineering four years ago on courses paid for by proud parents. Around a year ago, he told them he was in the United States taking part in a Boeing Aircraft Corporation seminar related to his studies. After that, he returned to Hamburg, receiving more help from his parents to study. When he later told them he was in Florida training as a pilot, they assumed all was well. His last call home came two days before the suicide attacks, when he thanked his ailing father for sending more money. His apartment manager says he paid cash weekly for one-bedroom accommodation and presented a German passport with a student visa. On May 2nd this year, he obtained a Florida driver's license. The same day, another terrorist suspect, Mohammed Atta, got his Florida driver's license. The only time he raised concern, they say, is when his Turkish girlfriend told them she thought he might have gone with friends to Afghanistan while they were separated for several weeks. The family says there's no proof of any trip to Afghanistan and are willing to cooperate with the international inquiry. What happened is a tragedy, a catastrophe for all people, and we don't agree on these acts, and we, uh, we, we are surprised and uh, shocked of what happened. The Lebanese authorities are stressing that neither the government nor its people at large have any link with the terror attacks against America, regardless of suspicions focused on one of its citizens. Standing ready, say officials here, to cooperate with investigations in any way they can. Brent Sadler, CNN, Beirut. And joining us from New York now is our senior analyst, Jeff Greenfield. Jeff, I know you've been thinking about the, uh, the consensus that seems to be developing in the United States right now, but inevitably there are going to be some serious differences. How will that affect this entire operation? I think it's really important Wolf, to understand that when, as it's inevitable, disagreements may be heard, it is not a sign of weakness. In fact, we may consider it a sign of, of strength. I mean, you go back to the Civil War, and within the North, uh, Lincoln was severely criticized for the conduct of the war. He thought, until the tide of the war turned, he might even have been turned out of office for a second term. We think of World War II as a time of great unity, and yet in 1941, relatively uh, just a couple of months or weeks before Pearl Harbor, a vote to extend the draft passed the House by one single vote. And even during the war, people in the Congress often were critical of Roosevelt for his conduct of the war. They raised objections to executive incursions on congressional authority. And think back again, Wolf, you covered this. When the Gulf War uh, began, the vote in the Senate in 1991 to authorize the use of force was 52 to 47. And, but once the war started, there was unity. I think it's very important not to confuse a consensus that something should be done with the need for such kind of lockstep that if we hear disagreements or dissent, we think that the country's weak. It just doesn't work that way. Is there going to be, in your opinion, is there going to, going to be some serious dissension if, in fact, uh, over the next few weeks and months, the U.S. is engaged in a serious, massive war? Well, the first question is, of course, how well will things go? One of the reasons there was virtually no dissent once the Gulf War began was that there, it, it, it ran into no obstacles. The, the, car, the bombing of Baghdad followed by a 100-hour ground war with virtually no American casualties, some, but far fewer than we thought. There was no room for dissent. This, as we've all been told, is going to be a much more difficult operation, stretching out, we've just heard on your broadcast, over months, if not years. The likelihood of casualties uh, are high. And Lord knows, we've seen just behind me the prospect of, of casualties at home, which we've never experienced as high. And the question at that point is whether or not if there are disagreements, if there are people who raise questions about how the war is conducted, it's going to be misinterpreted as a kind of broader discontent. I don't believe the country is going to be torn by dissension over the conduct of military, military operations. But when objections are heard to specific steps, I, I think we, taking some heart from our history, should understand it is actually part of the American tradition. Jeff Greenfield in New York, thank you very much, uh, as usual. Back to you, Joey. 
where the World Trade Center complex once stood. The massive rescue effort pushes on even at this hour. At last count, 152 bodies have been recovered from the site and nearly 5,000 people are still listed as missing. So the workers continue to toil over an estimated 1.25 million tons of skyscraper debris. Joining us from very near the rescue site is CNN's Martin Savage. Tell us on the latest on the operations there. Marty. Joy, it was another all-out day today by rescuers and searchers. It will be another all-out night. And it was another day when no survivors were pulled from the rubble. It is a problem here at this particular site, a problem that they would like to correct, seeing someone coming alive here. In addition to searching for survivors, the emergency officials are now telling their crews to be on the lookout for something else. Signs of stress, signs of strain, even the possibility of emotional breakdowns. Medical crews that have been out in the area say that emotional strain has been one of the most common maladies that they have been treating firefighters, police officers, and other rescuers today. Some of the New York City firefighters have not left this building, or what used to be the Twin Towers here, this site, since Tuesday, saying that there are simply too many of their own yet to be found. I talked to one firefighter who comes from Mechanicstown in New York, Tim Fascio, and he spoke about the very issue of morale. Well, you, we still have a lot of brothers down there that, you know, that are, hopefully we'll find them. But, uh, and I think that other victims, uh, they're trying to keep an upbeat, but it's, it's kind of hard to. But we're, we're all trying to be up, you know, trying to keep up there. It was also a time today when hundreds of people gathered on corners here to await their turn to return to their apartments, apartments they had to flee on that day of terror last Tuesday. They all had to be escorted into the area where their now vacant apartments are, and they were given 10 minutes, just 10 minutes, to collect their things, Joey. CNN's Martin Savage near Ground Zero. We want to move ahead now in New York City at this hour. Mayor Rudy Giuliani speaking about the rescue effort. Let's listen. Fian for Pete Gansey and for uh, Father Judge, and uh, and unfortunately, it probably is an indication of uh, what we're going to have to face in the future. Uh, but to each of their uh, families, we give their, our support, uh, love, and condolences. And uh, look upon this as uh, three people who have uh, lost their lives as the ca casualties of war. They are heroes. They're like the heroes uh, that we had at uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, each one of them was uh, trying to save lives. Pete Gancy uh, ev evacuated his, uh, his men, sent them north out of danger. He turned around, walked back south into danger in order to get more men out and was killed. Uh, Bill Feehan was directing the operation and wouldn't leave. And uh, Father Judge was administering the last rites to someone at the time that he died. Those are wartime casualties by anybody's description. And, and they are uh, they're, they, they're three heroes, and there are, there are many, many others. We're very uh, happy that we've been able to get the command center up this quickly because I think it, it uh, has, first of all, has a tremendous amount of practical value. It allows us to coordinate things, the city, the state, the federal government, much more effectively. It has a lot of symbolic value also. The command center was destroyed by these, uh, by these cowards that attacked us. Uh, the command center was destroyed on Tuesday. We've been operating out of uh, the police academy up until uh, now, and we put together quickly a command center, but the command center has been rebuilt uh, by Saturday and open and functioning. It's even bigger than the command center we had before, has more facilities, and I congratulate um, everybody who put this together, the, uh, uh, all of the people that worked on it from the Office of Emergency Management, from, from OEM, and from uh, the Economic Development Corporation that uh, controlled this site, that had to work on it, and DCAS, and all of the people that have uh, gotten this done. This is a miracle to have gotten this done as quickly as they did, and it's a great example of the fact that uh, we, can, uh, we can come back real quick and even better and stronger than we were before. Uh, we're very hopeful that uh, we're, gonna, we're going to uh, 
continue to uh, clean up the area and uh, get things as, uh, as back to normal as possible uh, by Monday. The uh, subway tests that we did today all seem to work, so there's no reason why uh, they won't work in they won't work uh, tomorrow and the next day, and we can get more things open. The stock exchange will be open. The mercantile exchange will be open. Um, we're going to have an additional ferry service on 58th Street and, Fir and First Avenue in, in Brooklyn to the Whitehall uh, Ferry Terminal. So there'll be a ferry from Brooklyn to Manhattan. There hasn't been a ferry from Brooklyn to Manhattan in a long, long time. And at some point after the Brooklyn Bridge was built, I think, they did away with the ferry from Brooklyn to Manhattan. But now there'll be a ferry from Brooklyn to Manhattan, and uh, it'll bring a lot of people to Wall Street. It'll start at 6 a.m. on Monday morning, go to 9 a.m., and then uh, operate between 3.30 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. at night. Uh, so it'll be another means of transportation. Uh, the medical examiner is here, and I, we're going to ask Dr. Hirsch to explain uh, the DNA uh, announcement that we're making uh, in order to alert people to um, to what they have to bring uh, they have to bring with them, and to uh, explain some of the uh, process that we'll be going through in the next uh, couple weeks, if not months. Uh, the economic development efforts seem to be working really well. It's a joint state and city effort. Uh, we're contacting lots of businesses, and so far the responses have been uh, very positive with regard to people wanting to stay, wanting to find new sites wanting to uh, continue to invest in the city. And with the number of people in the city of New York, uh, it, appears as if, um, it appears as if the city may be even more popular now than it used to be in the past as a place to come. Um, so the, amount, the support and the willingness of people to invest in the city and people to come to the city of New York may have actually increased as a result of this. Maybe that's a, a way of showing support for um, for the city of New York now that it's been attacked in the way that it has, but uh, we're very grateful for that. And um, we're also very grateful uh, for the President's visit. I think that's done an awful lot to, um, to demonstrate that kind of support. We've taken out uh, 22,008 tons of debris so far, uh, 2,047 uh, truckloads, and um, there have been uh, 85, um, 84, as of at least just counted about 3 o'clock this afternoon, 84 bodies that have been uh, recovered. Um, Those are identified. 60 others. I'm sorry. A 84 bodies that have been identified, uh, 60 more that have been uh, recovered, and the total uh, dead on arrival right now is 159 according to the uh, police department's uh, count. And uh, of those uh, uh, 24 firefighters, two civilian EMTs, two Port Authority police officers, one New Jersey uh, firefighter. And, um, as a, and our hearts go out to all of them because uh, each, in each one of those cases, we're going to have uh, situations like we had today. And tomorrow, uh, the, the fire uh, commissioner is going to um, is going to announce promotions. So we'll have him uh, describe that in a few minutes. Governor, thank you. Mayor, thank you. This is a um, sad day, and there will be other sad days as well. And uh, the prayers of all New Yorkers, and I believe all Americans, are with the families who went through the difficult process of uh, saying final goodbyes to their, the true heroes who have done so much to lead and inspire the fire department over the course of the uh, past uh, decades. Uh, I wanted to comment as well on President Bush's yesterday, uh, visit to New York yesterday. Uh, it was exactly what I believe New York needed. Uh, that visit was uh, uplifting and raised the morale of the hundreds and thousands of uh, heroes who are down there working on the site right now. It raised the spirits, I believe, of all New Yorkers. And uh, as we go through the suffering, one of the things the President did, along with the Mayor, um, yesterday uh, was to spend not a half hour, as he was scheduled to, but closer to three hours uh, with the families of some of those whose loved ones are, have pa passed on or are, are missing. Uh, and he shared tears with them and hugs with them and prayers with them. And I think that was enormously helpful. 
uh, to those families as they go through this uh, tremendous grief. And uh, uh, the mayor and I were uh, honored to have been with the president uh, while he showed this type of uh, uh, human side to his leadership during this very real crisis. Uh, the state deployment, uh, we're continuing to do everything we can to back up the tremendous effort that the, the city is making. We now have 4,500 4, National Guard uh, uh, troops activated here in the city. We're rotating on an ongoing basis 500 state police, and we have 22 different state agencies uh, working here to help with the uh, relief effort and recovery process. Um, which brings me to the question of volunteers. Volunteers. And uh, I was at the Javits Center earlier today, and we are just enormously grateful and proud to the literally tens of thousands of people from across America who have come here uh, to help out. I met people from uh, South Texas. I met a person from Montenegro who had come here in an effort to help out. It's just incredible, the outpouring of, uh, of support. And, uh, uh, but what we're telling people is that uh, control of the site is essential. Uh, that having people volunteer and go down to the site right now is not necessary. While we're very grateful for their uh, willingness to help and their commitment to be a part of the relief effort, uh, there are other better ways people can do it. Uh, and they should look to help. And some of the ways to do it are back home, where they're from, to uh, join their ambulance corps. We've been deploying those throughout the time. Join their fire department. Uh, help the Salvation Army and Red Cross go through their uh, relief efforts. Donate blood. Uh, these are all things that people out there who want to help can do uh, right in their home communities that could be of enormous help as we go forward. And uh, I wouldn't mind suggesting as well uh, that people who are that committed and interested could sign up and join the National Guard. Uh, because it's not just in times of war and military action that the National Guard is so helpful. It's ice storms and blizzards and fires and, of course, tragic attacks like this. So there is so much people can do without having to come to the site, and that's what we would encourage them to do as we go forward. Um, I also want to, again, people have been donating in our um, World Trade Center Relief Fund along with the city's Twin Towers Fund and the United Way's uh, September 11th Fund have been uh, just uh, incredibly uh, gratified by the outpouring of support and the, the, the uh, donations can be made uh, to the uh, World Trade Center Relief Fund through a website, www.state.my.us, and that will coordinate, we will coordinate with the Twin Towers Fund and the other relief funds as well. And, uh, finally, uh, the business assistance program was enormously successful. Yesterday we had close to 300 uh, entities from uh, individual proprietorships to large corporations coming in looking for help, and, and we will continue to offer that joint assistance, city, state, federal, to businesses looking uh, for that type of assistance. And the number, in addition to the city's operation down on Pine Street with our joint operation uh, on Third Avenue, is uh, that business Businesses looking for this help can call us 1-800-I-LOVE-NY. Uh, and we would encourage people to, to feel comfortable calling that number, and we'll do everything we can to help. So again, Mayor, thank you for your leadership. We thank the President for the incredible support that he and the federal government have shown, and uh, we're going to get through this. Thank you. Well, tomorrow we're going to uh, uh, promote about 160 uh, firefighters, uh, lieutenants, captains, battalion chiefs, deputy chiefs, and assistant chiefs to assist us uh, in this rescue effort and in the training that's necessary for so many new people that will be uh, in our squad units, our rescue units, and in addition to those um, people that we need to run those units, we need to uh, continue training and hazardous materials and everything else just to be prepared for anything that might happen in this in the city. So the fire department has been severely wounded. We've lost uh, uh, at least uh, missing uh, many of our top leaders, our top commanders, and we have to prepare even hopefully uh, if we find some, uh, certainly going to be very, very seriously injured. And we have to go on, and we'll begin that uh, tomorrow morning. Excuse me? We'll do it outside of uh, Fire Department headquarters tomorrow morning at noon. Can we replace Chief Yancey and 
Yes, Chief Nigro is going to assume Chief of Department, and Chief Cassano is going to be Chief of Operations. Second person was? Chief uh, Salvatore Cassano, C-A-S-S-A-N-O. And is Dan the Negro? Negro, N-I-G-R-O. I'm sorry. Daniel. Daniel. Richard. Uh, as the mayor said, uh, getting, getting the Emergency Operations Center back uh, in almost uh, less than 48 hours was a, a terrific, terrific uh, uh, effort by a lot of people. Uh, I want to thank Henry Jackson from my staff who uh, served as uh, my project manager. I want to thank Verizon who really uh, did a yeoman's job getting us telephone service. And, uh, and, and all the agencies, all the agencies that are, that are in here that helped get us back up uh, so we can uh, uh, work effectively, keep information flowing, and, and keep everyone informed. I have to do one thing, though, in exchange for Richie working for 48 hours, getting this, uh, getting this done. Paul Shearer is 13 years old today, so his dad owes him a birthday uh, present, uh, which may be interesting since uh, his Little League nickname is Hollywood, and he thinks uh, he's 30, not 13. So I'm going to wish Paul a happy birthday. And if you wish, if you wish him a happy birthday too. Though. All right, to our viewers who've been uh, watching this, you have been watching a bit of an update coming to us from the city leaders and state leaders of New York. Mayor Giuliani leading the way with Governor Pataki as well. The mayor, uh, remembering those have been lost. Of course, there were fire uh, funerals for three key figures in the fire department today as well. They, he was talking about how the city moves forward from this point. He noted that 84 people have been identified now from the World Trade Center site. Uh, 60 people have, more people have been recovered. But the number of missing at the World Trade Center site is still in the neighborhood of 5,000 individuals. And so the work goes on there. Moving on now to consider, to date, New York hospitals have treated more than 3,700 injuries related to the Twin Towers attacks. Aside from rescue workers who were hurt on the job, the number of victims at local hospitals has dropped off now. Joining us from St. Vincent's, which is one of the key hospitals involved in the emergency work, is CNN's Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who is with our medical unit. Dr. Gupta, what are you seeing there? Well, I'm here at St. Vincent's, just like you say, Joey. And we haven't seen as many patients as we've seen posters and, and crowds of people looking at the missing wall, trying to find a friend, a neighbor, a relative, somebody. We've seen vigils being held all around the hospital, things like that. People walking up with posters, signs, things like that to try and recruit any help to try and find their loved ones. We haven't seen as many patients, maybe five or so over the entire day today. Uh, there's about 35 patients in the hospital right now. As you say, over 500 have been treated at St. Vincent's over the last four days. And Sanjay, can you talk to us a little bit uh, about what the expectations are now? I mean, indeed, from the beginning of this, there had been the expectation that all the hospitals would be flooded, that there, there would be a great demand for the medical experts to be able to come in, and yet it doesn't seem that they have had as many to treat as they might have anticipated. What are the expectations now for what might lie ahead? Well, it's, ama it's a really quite amazing. I actually spoke to one of the ER doctors just recently, and the doctors do remain somewhat optimistic. They, they kind of went over with me a little bit of what it takes to actually try and retrieve bodies from the rubble. And I think we have a graphic that actually talks a little bit about that. But it's a really sort of uh, intricate, amazing process. It starts with sort of assessing the structure around the buildings and certainly do, doing what's called surface removal, removing bodies that are, that are obviously found at the surface. And then you've heard so much about voids. These are air pockets, Joey, that could be anywhere within the rubble, and there could even be sub-basements that actually have air within them. Then, then after that, there's actually a tunneling and trenching process that goes on to try and get to the bodies without actually removing all of the rubble as of yet. Removing the rubble, the final procedure, the rescue and recovery procedure, is a very dangerous procedure, and that's why they go through these other four steps first to try and make sure they can get any bodies they can ahead of time. When they actually remove the remove all the rubble after that, and we're seeing different stages of this as we look at the at uh, Ground Zero, that's when they actually find uh, the rest of the bodies, Joey. 
But Sanjay, we're talking about an event that took place on Tuesday morning. It is now into Saturday evening. Is the expectation from the medical experts uh, that, that this is still survivable at this point? There is a, a degree of optimism that I'm still sensing, Joey. Talking to the doctors here at St. Vincent's, talking to the doctors here in New York, some of whom are my friends, there are some limiting steps, though. There certainly are some obstacles that they're concerned about. I think we can have a graphic as well to talk about this. Certainly oxygen deprivation. If you're in a situation where you just don't have oxygen, that's going to be a greatly limiting step to survival. Dehydration. If you, if you happen to be stuck in a place where you couldn't get to